Okay, that woke me up. Seriously, the topic for today is spotlight, so let's get into it. The spotlight and the point light share two main characteristics. They both have a position in the 3D world, and since they are man-made, their intensity attenuates as the distance from the object to the light source grows. Both characteristics were addressed in the previous tutorial on point lights. The unique characteristic of the spotlight is that it has a specific direction. We expect the spotlight to affect objects that are inside some kind of a cone with the spotlight direction in its center. Naturally, we would like to be able to control the aperture of the cone. This simply means the ability to go from a narrow cone base to a wider one. The most natural thing to do would be to set the angle of the cone aperture. If the angle between the spotlight direction and the vector that goes from the spotlight to the pixel is larger than that angle, the pixel will not receive any light from this spotlight. In 3D rendering, it is common to call this angle the cutoff angle, so uh, we will use this semantic as well. Here you can see a few examples based on this approach with different cutoff angles. These examples are not that great, you know. We have full intensity within the cone and uh, total darkness outside. This is too abrupt and uh, doesn't look natural. We expect to see a, a graceful decrease of the light intensity from the center of the cone to the cutoff angle. These three elements, the spotlight direction, the cutoff angle, and the graceful decrease of light intensity define the effect of the spotlight on the 3D scene. Let's see how to handle them mathematically. The method that we've been developing over the course of the last few tutorials is to do the lighting calculations in local space. This means transforming all the world space entities, such as the camera position and the light direction, from world to local. The spotlight position and direction are both defined in world space. Luckily for us, we've already covered the transformations of these two elements in the previous tutorials. Therefore, I'll just say very briefly that in order to transform the direction vector from world to local, we need to undo any rotation that was applied on the object to get it from local to world space. Check out the tutorial on directional lighting for more information about that. In order to transform the spotlight position from world to local, we need to undo the translation and rotation that were applied on the object to get it from local to world space, if any. For more information about that, check out the previous tutorial on point lighting. During the code review section, we will see how to share the logic of these transformations between the different light sources. Next up is the cutoff angle, and as usual, the dot product is here to save the day. We have the direction vector of the spotlight and the vector that goes from the camera to the pixel. A dot product between two normalized vectors provides the cosine of the angle between them. When the two vectors point to the same direction, the angle is zero and the cosine is one. When the two vectors are perpendicular to each other, the angle is 90 and the cosine is zero. We're going to set the cutoff angle between zero and 90 degrees because anything beyond that means that the aperture of the cone will be more than 180 degrees and it doesn't make much sense. In fact, the cutoff angle is probably going to be much closer to zero than to 90. Let's say that the angle is 20 degrees, which sets the aperture at 40. The cosine of 20 is about uh, 0.9396. Providing the original angle to the fragment shader doesn't make much sense. The fragment shader will need to calculate the cosine of the angle per pixel which is a very costly operation and will give the same result each time. Instead, we can calculate the cosine in the application code and send the result to the shader. Then we only need to do a dot product between the light direction and the light to pixel vector and compare it to the cosine of the cutoff angle. If it is greater, the pixel is inside the cone of influence of the spotlight and we can continue calculating the light intensity as if it is a point light. If it is smaller, it is outside of the cone and there is no light in this case. From now on, let's call this angle alpha. This brings us to the final step 
of making the spotlight intensity gracefully decrease as we move from the center of the cone to its edges. This is a classic case for linear interpolation. We've just established that the valid range of the cosine of alpha is between x and 1, where x is the cosine of the cutoff angle. We want to map this range to 0 to 1. The cosine of the cutoff angle will be mapped to 0, which will eliminate the light when we reach the edge of the cone. When the pixel is directly at the center of the cone, alpha equals to 0, the cosine of alpha is 1, and we want to map it to 1 to get maximum intensity at this point. Let's subtract the cosine of alpha from 1 and divide it by the delta between 1 and the cosine of the cutoff angle. When the pixel is on the edge of the cone, the cosine of alpha equals to the cosine of the cutoff angle, and the result of this equation will be 1. When the pixel is on the center of the cone, the cosine of alpha equals to 1, and the result of this equation will be 0. This is actually exactly the opposite of the mapping that we're trying to achieve. All we need to do in order to fix it is to subtract the result of this equation from 1. Now we get 1 in the center of the cone and 0 on its edge. Everything in between is nicely interpolated between these two values. Perfect. Now let's see some code. Damn, I love this job. Okay, so there hasn't been any change in the vertex shader in the past two tutorials, so let's go directly to the fragment shader. I define the maximum number of spotlights to be two here. We're going to need that in the definition of the actual spotlight array. I've also added a structure for the spotlight, which contains the point light as a base member, along with the spotlight specific members, the direction vector, and the cutoff angle. Remember that this is actually the cosine of the angle and not the angle itself. Same as with point lights, we have a uniform that contains the actual number of spotlights because sometimes it may be lower than whatever you define to be the maximum. And we have the array of spotlights right here. Let's scroll down to the main function. I made a small change in the calc point light function. It now takes the actual point light structure instead of just the index. This allows us to share the code by the point and the spotlight because the point light is a member inside the spotlight. Same as with point lights, we loop over the actual number of spotlights and accumulate their contribution to the total light intensity. Let's see how to calculate the spotlight color. First, we subtract the position of the spotlight from the position of the pixel to get the pixel to light vector. Remember that this is done in local space. The local position of the pixel is provided by the vertex shader and the local position of the light source must be calculated in the application. We're gonna see that in a couple of minutes. Also remember to normalize the result so that we can calculate the cosine of alpha with a dot product of the light to pixel vector and the light direction. We compare the cosine result with the cutoff value. If it is less than or equal, it means that the pixel is outside of the spotlight influence, so we return zero. If it's greater than the cutoff value, we calculate this light as if it is a regular point light, and we perform the interpolation equation that we've just developed. Finally, we use the result to modulate the color that we return back to the main function. This is the main change of the fragment shader. Now let's see the changes in the lighting technique class. Here we can see the definition of the spotlight class, which derives from the point light. The new members are, again, the direction vector in world space and the cutoff angle. The user of this class is going to manipulate these members directly and then call calc local direction and position using the world transformation object of the mesh to do the transformation to local space. The position will be handled by the point light class and the direction by this new class. In the lighting technique class itself, I've added a matching definition of the maximum number of spotlights and a function to set the spotlight parameters into the shader using the actual number of spotlights and the pointer to an array of spotlights. In the private section, we have two new uniforms for the location of the new shader objects, the number of spotlights and the spotlight structures themselves. Let's jump to the definition of this class. First, 
we can see that the code that we developed during the directional light tutorial to transform the light direction from world to local has been moved to the world transform class under the world dear to local dear function. This allows us to share this piece of code between the directional light and the spotlight. In the function calc local direction and position, we start by calling upon the super class to transform the light position, and then we transform the direction using the same function that we use for the directional light. I'm going to skip the code that fetches the uniform locations of the spotlight array and go down directly to the set spotlights function that actually sends the light attributes down to the shader. We need to make sure to send the local position and the local direction and also to normalize the direction vector to make it dot product ready. The last set of changes in the application code is pretty straightforward. I've added an array of spotlights and initialized some of its attributes in the tutorial class constructor. In the render function, we update the position and direction of each spotlight. One spotlight is constant, so I could have done this in the constructor as well, but I wanted to keep this piece of code together. The other spotlight follows the camera position and target vector. Before we set the spotlights into the shader, we must call calc local direction and position using the world transform object of the mesh which is going to be rendered. We have three meshes here, so we need to do this again for the other two meshes. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you on the next tutorial. Thank you.